Ahusat, um, sorry, First Nation. And uh, July 2012, he was elected to a second consecutive three-year mandate as National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations. First Nations from across Canada supported him in confirming education as a top priority for the Assembly. Apache and Chevron also see training and education as a top priority for our entire Kitimat LNG project. Please welcome Chief Atlio. Thank you uh, so much. We should add that, uh, that that means that it was Kerry Price from Ogacho beating out Ted Nolan. Not bad. I think that's, that's pretty amazing when you think you got two First Nations uh, on the biggest stage in the Olympics uh, going toe to toe. So of course we wish Ted Nolan well, but how about Kerry Price bringing it home for us? That's fantastic. So. <laughs> Chu na adlich chani tlak shet na ata adlich chani tlak shet utla se sha in chat his tak shet a hozet a hozet nu chani khat tlak ke speed ma as ha oya tai ha oya ya ki su a ir fit tlak go su set shet net ni exu Giving expression in my language, the language of the Ahausa people, part of New Channel, west coast of Vancouver Island, my deepest respects. Ma Chinopsik, Ma Tikitsu, Treaty 8 First Nations. Thankful for all of you chiefs from Treaty 8 and your people for welcoming me here. Our peoples, wherever we come from, the first thing we do is to express our respect to the people of the territories as we're reminded somebody else's law applies where you're visiting. You respect their laws when you're there. Also acknowledging the words and the prayer of the elder. Thankful for the prayer that she spoke and I heard her thinking about the moose, the water, and offering prayers to people the way our people always do. Wanting, our, wanting others to feel good, to be safe, wanting to respect each other, love one another, care for one another. So the moment I arrived, I got to listen to an elder speak. And it reminds me of being at home. I know the chiefs of the, the various communities of Treaty 8. I know there's a number of you here. Chief Norman Davis, Chief Harley Davis, Chief Lynette Zakoza, Chief Charlene Gale, I just saw just when I came in. It's nice to see you again. Chief Derek Orr, and I know others are, are not here. Former Chief Gary Oker, it's good to see you. I remember our time spent together up in your territories as well. I'm very, very honored to be back here in Treaty 8 territory. My heart goes out to the Taltan. We know that there are some people in pain and they're grieving at this moment. And we're always advised to be careful when we're in the midst of those who are, who are feeling that pain. I see many faces that I recognize in the room and I'm honored to be here. I, I join in uh, recognizing Grand Chief Stuart Phillip. He is the road warrior of this province, right? I mean, that guy puts more miles on his truck and thank goodness he's, I got text messages as he was getting into the Penticton General Hospital. <laughs> I was scared. I was scared for him. He travels so much in that truck. I don't know if it's because he doesn't like to fly as much. I don't know if that's what it is, but. I join in acknowledging and thankful that, that he's okay and he's going to have a full recovery. Grand Chief Ed John, I see you sitting amongst your Deneza, your relatives. I know it's always important for you to be amongst, amongst all your relatives. Always uh, thankful for the, the ability to learn from and work with Grand Chief Ed John for so many years, as with so many other leaders, uh, Dave Porter, uh, big brother Dave Porter. And I'm just re really honored to be here in your midst to be welcomed back into Treaty 8 territory for such an important conversation. And I've had, I've had the opportunity to receive a little bit of a sense for the kind of discussion that you're having. Treaty 8 Tribal Association and uh, uh, Tribal Chief Liz Logan, I'm very thankful for the invitation to be here, uh, to be able to share some thoughts, but also contribute to the conversation. 
this work is important. It's important uh, that this region be acknowledged. It's always been, uh, but not acknowledged as being the breadbasket of the economy of, of British Columbia. And now here it is, that the First Nations are hosting that conversation about how it is that it's driven the economy for BC for so long. And it's really a testament to the leadership of First Nations and the encouragement that we heard from the elder. It feels like a theme that's emerging as you conclude this third day of your conference is to come together. And that's a very strong encourage, encouragement we receive from our elders from whatever territories that we come from. I'm thankful as well to have had a, a chance to listen to Minister Rustad for, for you to speak. Um, your, even your title, the, the notion that this work is about relationships and in fact it's about reconciliation. That uh, Treaty 8 uh, uh, writes that the treaty is real, it's as alive today as it was the day it was forged. And one of my responsibilities as National Chief is to support and advocate for all First Nations across the country. That the treaty rights are real, to be respected and honored. And that the Treaty 8 First Nations people um, have an, an obligation to uphold the, the sacredness of those treaties. And also it's extended to those who've settled in your territories. They have an obligation to uphold the spirit and intent of that treaty as well. And so I arrive here feeling that that's what this conversation is about. It's about listening and it's about learning. And it's not always been an easy conversation over the last several days, I'm sure. Not, not all the time will it be a, a meeting of the minds or seeing eye to eye. But it's by listening and learning and truly seeking to find a path to under, understanding that, that uh, you, can, you can see a way forward. So that notion of, of reconciliation and building relationships that the minister just spoke from is important in all aspects of our life. Whether it's uh, child welfare, standing up and supporting the residential school survivors in our communities. I think about the moment when 70,000 people walked with the survivors in Vancouver, not that long ago, where the keynote speaker was the daughter of former um, civil rights leader, Martin Luther King. It was a very powerful moment as this country is becoming, I think, awakened to the notion that treaty rights are real, uh, beginning to understand the full implications of the history that we've collectively, I think, been born into and the responsibility to un understand it. And so those terms, are, uh, about uh, recognition, about relationships, and minister about reconciliation. This is the hard work of this moment, that we're in this moment in history. I think about uh, the issue <coughs> of murdered missing women and the fact that I know Grand Chief Stuart Phillip was at the march that happens every February 14th, downtown Vancouver. And I'm sure that's the, the, that's the, the trip back that he was taking because he's always attending those, those marches and those walks in downtown East Side and will continue to press for, for issues like that to be acknowledged in the way that they must be, and that is for a full National Public Commission of Inquiry onto the, the issue of murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls. And that effort will be, uh, will be something that First Nations will continue to be relentless around. So in all aspects of our lives, the issues of the safety and security of our people, our children, education, including the work uh, in uh, the area of LNG, economics and natural resources, the words of the elder. It's uh, something that I've been invited to reflect on is the work of the Assembly of First Nations and supporting this work that you're doing, which is really to enable the meaningful engagement and participation of impacted First Nations communities within British Columbia, especially as it pertains to this sector. And in some respects, the vision is very similar to that of others in the land that we share. It's about, absolutely, it's about having a measure of prosperity for our people for our children, for future generations. It's about wanting to do that which the ancestors left inscribed in treaty in the spirit and intent, the, the idea of sharing in the wealth of our lands and resources. For far too long, industry and government have been ignoring our rights, exploiting the resources in our traditional territories, and at times, destroying our lands, wildlife, and many of us experience this firsthand in our territories, our sacred sites as well. This speaks really, when we especially listen to our elders, compel us to be careful to think this through, speaks to our very survival. I think it's fair to say that our peoples have faced very difficult circumstances ever since the time of contact. Early European diseases and now illness due to pollution generated by natural resource extraction over the last 50 years are realities. Our peoples forcibly taken, as I alluded to in the residential school era, and the growing awareness of this tragic chapter in our shared history. And it's a legacy that's with us even to this day. I know that the chiefs that I've mentioned, 
that uh, those of you are Treaty 8 territories, and I know other nations are here. Uh, I saw some from uh, the Haida and the Gitsan, uh, Gitanyao and others who are present. We know this experience. We've lived it. In fact, we're still living with the impacts today. Increasingly, what's helpful is that the rest of the world is starting to learn too, starting to understand what it means to be living side by side with people in Treaty 8 territory who's, who were forcibly removed from their parents and sent off to residential schools as, a, as one of the worst expressions of unilateral policies that this government has ever, has ever undertaken. Thank goodness that we were able to press for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to have at least another year to keep doing their work so that the truth of what really happened could be told like the nutritional experiments that I heard about around the dinner table when I was a kid explained to me by my dad now just making headlines in the summer of 2013. So there is a consciousness, a collective consciousness awareness, an awareness growing that, that I think signifies this moment. And what I'm always impressed with, inspired by, motivated, is the incredible resilience of our people. The ability to come through, the increase in resolve that I witness in the young people, uh, amongst especially the elders who've come through and have borne the brunt of, of some of the worst of, of uh, the severing of, of families, of taking attempts to take away language and culture. Notwithstanding all of that, our people are still here, still taking their grandchildren out onto the waters and out onto the land. So we know that we've got that resilience in us to be able to survive. And conversations like this are about how we thrive together. I think about your, your uh, leader, Liz Logan, as uh, Chief Logan spoke with the Special Rapporteur from the United Nations, James and Aya, talking about the daily struggles that Treaty 8 faces over the long term and, and ongoing destruction of lands by oil and gas, by hydro, by mining and forest industries. Telling Mr. Anaya that government and industry have ignored their treaty that guaranteed land use rights for as long as the sun shines, the grass grows, and the rivers flow. And if I'm not mistaken, Grand Chief John, Mr. Anaya has been nominated, right, for a Nobel Peace Prize. So an indigenous leader, uh, not unlike others, I think we could put uh, late Nelson Mandela in that category as a chief from his home territory. So you see our people, whether they're hockey players like Kerry or leaders like James and Aya, we have, of course, like the elders say, the ability to, to uh, do anything and, and accomplish things that we set our mind and our heart to. So this is about seeing the next generations that come behind us, have that vision secured that as long as the sun shines and the rivers flow. This is also a story that I hear emerging in this conference, but I observe it all across the country, that First Nations aren't against development, but just not supportive of development at any cost. And there's strong distinctions that First Nations express, that it has to be done in a responsible and sustainable way. It absolutely must respect our rights. I know in last week's throne speech, uh, Premier Clark, uh, uh, Minister, placed the future survival of, of the province's economy, which you have alluded to here as well, on the development of this industry, promising that LNG revenues would help erase the 60 billion in provincial debt also extending that First Nations would be fully involved as partners, that LNG development would be done as environmentally responsible as possible. And so now I think uh, an event like this with your presence is now about putting those words into action. We also saw in last week's uh, uh, recent federal budget that the government has delayed its response to D Doug Iford's report to the Prime Minister. This report in included a number of positive recommendations on engaging First Nations as full partners in future energy projects in Western Canada, making it very clear that our people and our rights are not to be subjected to being merely viewed as stakeholders within this discussion. The next four or five months are absolutely critical for determining the future of the Canadian energy industry in the West, and I believe it's got implications much broad, more broad than that. From LNG, natural gas and oil in Treaty 8 to the fate of the Northern Gateway Pipeline. Just last month, I was also in Treaty 8 territory on the other side of the mountains, in Fort McMurray, Alberta, speaking to a largely pro-development oil and gas crowd that includes First Nations that are involved in these projects. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Chief Jim Boucher was, was present or, or was, was part of this event from Fort, Mac Fort uh, Mackay, being a speaker here. So he may have shared that uh, Fort Mackay has established their group of companies, they service the oil sands, they generate 100 million in revenues annually, they employ 4,000 people, many of whom are not First Nations people. They have agreements as well with First Nations to the south of them. I think most would also be aware 
that Fort Mackay recently filed an Alberta court, court appeal action to prevent an energy company from developing oil sands that could pollute their traditional territories. They want at least a 20 kilometer buffer zone between oil sands production and their traditional lands. So the message this sends is the same one that First Nations across the country and the Assembly of First Nations shares, both to government and industry. The AFN has begun work on developing a national First Nations energy strategy. I think back to 2010 when we held an international energy and mining summit in Niagara Falls, and we did so in partnership with the National Congress of the American Indian. We did because we could see the pipeline proposals coming down the road. We could see that our rights weren't necessarily going to be, because they weren't being re regarded. In many respects, we're still not seen in, in the formal processes that exist. It's going to require political will and recognition on the, on the part of governments, leadership on the part of industry. And I think one of the themes arising out of this summit amongst you as chiefs is to work together. The strength in coming together and combining your efforts, not always easy because we are not all the same. I get this question all the time across the country. Sean, how come all the First Nations don't just do the same thing all the time? Well, we're 633, we're 52 different languages. There's over 100 different kinds of treaties that have been forged, including modern day. So we are diverse, but we are absolutely have so much in common as well about how we've been in impacted by the residential school era, about how resources have been taken from our territories, about how our, our rights have not been acknowledged and have been ignored or dismissed, about how we fought and won over 150 court cases now on pr principally issues of natural resources. Some say one of the longest winning legal streaks around the world, First Nations in Canada, even in the domestic courts, winning major, major, major battles. I think that the key element of the strategy going forward is about relationships, it's about reconciliation, it's also about being clear that this is based on treaties, it's based on rights, it's based on the Royal Proclamation, it's based on the Jay Treaty, it's based on the modern treaties. Supporting relationships is based on the notions of peace and friendship and of coexistence. It's about the environment, it's about environmental sustainability. My 27-year-old son is one of the, I just, I love the way he talks about it. Dad, when Grandpa took us down to bring the first fish that we caught every year down to the water, it was explained, we got to give thanks for that first fish. We give our appreciation to it. But my son said, you know, it's also, scientifically, it's regenerative. And he says, Dad, we need to keep pushing for regenerative economics. That notion of giving back, of finding balance and harmony. So these are long-term challenges that First Nations are bringing a vision to this country. It's already being expressed, even if it doesn't show up in the way that uh, projects are reviewed and assessed. Increasingly, we see that that's happening, but First Nations are having a significant impact on natural resources in Canada. Case in point, 2005, Natural Resource Canada estimated that First Nations had an impact over five to six billion in natural resource projects. I was astounded that that's all they thought that we had an impact on. In my own community, I could point to an $8 billion mine project that now my son, as part of Chief and Council, has influence over at the age of 27. One of the fastest growing segments of our Canadian population, First Nations, the vast majority under the age of 25. And over the course of 2013, who was leading the round dances in the malls and, and who was leading the walks in the streets and locking arms with Canadians of, of, of all backgrounds, with Métis and Inuit, our young people. And they're the ones that I, I believe are importantly going to need to be recognized, involved, included, informed, and for their voices to be, I think, an important part of this work that uh, the leadership is, is engaged in. The free, prior, and informed consent that anchors the UN Declaration brings us all together as First Nations. Whether you're from a house where we don't have a treaty, or Treaty 8, this is, these are the kind of language that can bring us together as well. We have the right to free, prior, and informed consent to have a say over what happens in our territories for natural resources, but also what happens in other areas like education, child welfare, our health systems, etc. So it isn't about just being opposed to development, but being involved uh, from the outset. Otherwise, communities see few options. The result is frustration and potential confrontation. And 2014 is different than 20, 2006 or 2007. I was giving a speech in Edinburgh, Scotland, to the School of Canadian Studies. Who would think that they have a School of Canadian Studies in Scotland? Like, they study Canada. 
And I was there, I was giving a presentation to a class, and we were talking about natural resource development in Canada. And I said, you know, it's so incredible now that I bet you before my speech is over and before my 45 minutes is done, that somebody here will get an email, probably from Elsie Bookduck, New Brunswick, and the Atlantic coast about the issue of fracking and the protests and some of the violence. No sooner did I, those words leave my lips than somebody stood up and said, I just received an email from somebody in Elsie Bookduck. The transmission of information that happens now, the conversations that occur over social media, the need to ensure that, that communication we recognize moves at lightning fast now is also part of this. And how much up in my language? I think this is very much the way it used to work in the feast house. The chief would do the work in public, showing, showing the people. So how much up people need to know. That was always our way. People included, people understanding. And it remains, I think, one of the most important challenges that we have and important opportunities to embrace. Our people will mobilize themselves and naturally through the moccasin grapevine known as Facebook, uh, <laughs> Twitter, other things. We also know that there's about 100 million that gets expended by the Federal Department of Indian Affairs fighting us in courts. And we continue to see the results, including, I might add, the, the New Channel Fisheries case. Just throwing a little plug in there from the New Channel, the West Coast. <laughs> so I think that this. This event that you're holding, bringing together the various voices, so important around that notion of engaging early and engaging often, because we know what it's like to, to, to be asked to come to the table deep into a, a project's uh, proposal. We see the federal government's recent streamlining of the regulatory process, and it's concerning. While we can all agree on principles like efficiency, we have to see a clear and explicit commitment for our rights and interest to be addressed as a required constitutional duty. There is absolutely a path for win-win solutions for all involved. It requires pursuing this understanding, looking to our inherent rights and title, the treaties, and the principles of respect, recognition, partnership, and sharing. Just as government and industry have learned the importance of protocol in entering a foreign market, no more was this apparent than when I traveled with the delegation to China, Guanxi, Guanxi, I don't know if there's any Chinese speakers in the room. Pardon me? Betchuan. Oh, when we traveled to Betchuan, um, the idea of, of operating overseas, companies needing to understand the, the protocols and the culture, and taking the time to build those relationships. And you see how those assumptions have been bypassed, by and large, in our own backyard, where our, our peoples, as I was saying earlier, not seen uh, necessarily both from a legal or from a an informal uh, process. So imagine if our communities and the recognition of our inherent and treaty rights were given the same if not greater attention from the Prime Minister and Ministers as spent on trade missions and investment deals with foreign countries. Our economic visions are not so far apart. We envision sustainable communities with healthy families as central to our overall success. We want our children to have a chance for a great education. We want our children, like all families do, to look forward to their future and have opportunities that they define. It's taken so much time and energy to get where we are in this situation today. And I stand proud to say that, albeit an incredible struggle and a long journey, that we've made progress. You're no, you're no doubt aware of the major announcement on February 7th as a new way forward, leading to First Nations control of First Nations education. This is the result of more than 40 years of dedicated advocacy and efforts aimed at this objective. At the Special Chiefs Assembly in December, chiefs and delegates all stood up unanimously to reject the proposed education bill. The proposed First Nations Education Act is now dead. The new approach places our children front and center and is founded on our rights, our treaties, and our jurisdiction. And this, in my view, is a strong testament of the dedication and the leadership of so many, especially of our young people. I think of late. Shannon Kustachin from Attawapiskat, who journeyed to tell the Minister of Indian Affairs that her community deserved a school. Well, she stood up now as one of the heroes of our young people across the country. She, she died tragically in a car accident. I received news, by the way, of this resolution while I was attending to the ceremony of the memorial for the late Nelson Mandela in Johannesburg. And while I was there, I was told that the chiefs were having perhaps their best meeting ever and I took it personally, thinking I will stay away now 
from all chiefs' assemblies because they, they said they had such a great assembly. I will stay away now from here on in. But it wasn't lost on me, and, and I absolutely had informal conversations with four former and one current prime minister, two former governor generals, and the leader of the opposition. Don't ever forget what that system that late Nelson Mandela fought to overcome was inspired by the Indian Act and reserve system in Canada. It was brought there. Late Nelson Mandela helped fight to overcome that legacy and serves as an incredible inspiration. He came, like I said at the outset, as a chief from his little village. And I was grateful to be there and thankful for the support from the chiefs from across the country to recognize that we need to stand in honor the memory and legacy of a great Indigenous leader, the likes of late Nelson Mandela. Now, now it's time for Canada to be inspired in its own backyard that we can achieve, we can overcome the challenges that we've collectively inherited, including an Indian Act that still exists, including the challenges that I've been referring to here. So I was very thankful for a resolution that respects and, and, and seeking an approach that would respect and recognize rights, title, treaties, and jurisdiction, provide for a statutory guarantee of funding, which we've never had. It's always year to year, discretionary on the part of the minister, and a guarantee that would have predictable annual growth to ensure funding keeps pace with the cost of delivering quality education. Most of Canada now knows there's about a two to $7,000 gap between that which a Canadian average student in the average school receives. So when you start thinking about fulfilling these jobs, this is about, it's also about investing in First Nations young people as well when it comes to the mainstream economy. But in light of the legacy of the efforts to take away language and, uh, language and culture, the chief said it must include support for languages and culture. That it calls for not just saying it's okay for unilateral accountability on the part of the minister, but that it would have to include reciprocal accountability. That's the spirit of treaty. That's the spirit of truly working together. You share the outcomes, but you share the obligations together. And provide for ongoing meaningful dialogue. It was always the idea. To, to give effect to treaty, the spirit and intent, is you keep working on it. It's not once the agreement's over that the relationship is, is over. So this clear direction uh, set out the conditions that the role of the Assembly of First Nations, like with LNG, is not, not to direct or to tell First Nations how to organize themselves or to how to approach their vision in areas like LNG, or in this case, I'm talking about education. It, it has to be driven and led by First Nations themselves. First Nations, after all, know the best solutions for your own children. This is an opportunity for First Nations to fully realize what First Nations control of First Nations education means to them. To get the minister and the government out of our schools and to support success for our children and our students in our way. Some First Nations have already implemented their vision of First Nations education. Some are embarking on new approaches the new approach that's being uh, put forward will not impact any existing agreements or approaches, including the groundbreaking work that I've been proud to support and work with as well, led by the First Nations Education Steering Committee here in British Columbia. Rather, it will enable and support approaches designed and driven by First Nations and regions across the country. This work belongs, as it rightfully should, to every region, to every treaty area, and every First Nation to determine your path forward, enabling and supporting the sec success of your children. My role, the role of the National Chief, as I repeat often, I am not the, in, the Prime Minister of Indians. That's not my role. My role is to support the heads of governments, which I've acknowledged here today. Those chiefs with your people, with your councils. You are the heads of First Nations governments. My obligation is to stand with you and to support that which was pushed for 40 years, including vigorously over the last three, four years. That's to demand that we have a statutory guarantee of funding. And we heard that commitment in the announcement of the 2014 federal budget. The resources are now securely locked into the federal budget. They're in A-base, they're predictable, and, uh, and they're sustainable over the long run, moving from a 2% cap to a 4.5% um, escalator. It's significant in our work towards addressing the needs of education. But the hard work, the hard work is far from over. First Nations have the expertise and the solutions to ensure success for our children and our students, to reach out to bridge relationships with First Nations, families, schools and communities, to bridge those relationships as well with the provincial government, given that resources are received by the province for First Nations learners as well in the provincial system. 
We're going to need to continue to be innovative, to be collaborative. The new approach will help rebuild our languages and cultures, our indigenous values and our traditional knowledge, all of which connect us to creation, our lands, our waters, and our territories. This is an unshakable, an unbreakable bond. This is a valuable perspective that First Nations are, can, and will continue to bring to all development. I know, not only in Treaty 8 territories, but in all territories across the country. The UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples calls on states to work in mutual partnership and respect with Indigenous peoples and sets out the standard that I mentioned, free, prior, and informed consent. We all know that this is both possible and practical for business and governments, and it's necessary for sustainable mutual benefit. So what does it mean specifically for business? It means supporting local economies and investing as good corporate citizens, something already done in, in a vast majority of places where business operates. Working with First Nations should be no different. In fact, we invite the LNG industry to understand First Nations views, understand our views, and to work with us. Working with our communities is a strategic, long-term economic stimulus plan for all of Canada. This goes beyond LNG employment and service contracts. This is about ownership. It's about partnership, meaningful results for everyone. There is no question, as a former entrepreneur myself, starting out as a break dancer and then a coffee, coffee entrepreneur, that we have a strong entrepreneurial spirit. I think about Mr. Beaton down here when he started with his firm and how, how he and others, Gary Oker, as an entrepreneur, even as a chief, I knew he had this entrepreneurial bent. And I know we have many of our people that are, that are like that. We have the ability. That entrepreneurial spirit is certainly alive and well. Communities are engaging in clean energy projects to the tune, I think, 34 billion on an annual basis led by First Nations across the country, building and owning infrastructure. Communities are investing in their workforce and entering into partnerships, finding projects, supports, and networks, and working to bring their economic strategies to life. So as you can see, as I conclude here, First Nations strive for innovation. First Nations are serious about economic opportunities as well. First Nations are and will become increasingly important economic agents, unleashing our full potential and supporting sustainable opportunities in Canada's critical resource sector, the labour force and the economy. Whether through LNG, agriculture, mining, fishing, forestry or emerging technologies, our nation and our rights are a reality and they present unlimited opportunities if we get this right. And I believe, and I know many of you, I'm sure share that notion that we absolutely can. When this happens, when this vision that the ancestors left at the time of forging treaty, when we're full partners in this country with Canada, when our rights, when our title and treaties are recognized and respected, then we will not simply survive, we will then thrive. We will prosper as partners, unleashing the full potential of our people and our nations. We can absolutely do this together. Tleko, tleko. Thank you so much. Masicho. Uh, uh, Chief, on behalf, on behalf of the, uh, uh, the LNG Summit Planning Committee, uh, from all the members of Treaty 8, the uh, Chiefs and Councils, we would like to present you this gift in uh, recognition of your kind words, your wisdom, and uh, your acceptance to uh, come down here and be with us today. Thank you so much. It's appreciated. Hi, hi. I'd like to also say a special thanks to uh, Chief Sean Atlio, who actually changed his plans midstream, um, you know, to come here and, and uh, present to us. Again, uh, you know, with St Chief Stuart Phillips' uh, accident, um, he was to be our keynote, but again, thank you again to um, uh, Grand Chief Sean Atlio. A couple of uh, housekeeping announcements, and again, a big thank you to um, uh, Apache, uh, David Calvert, uh, Kitimat LNG Project for sponsoring our two great speakers that we had. We, we really appreciate our sponsors and thank you again. And some of the other sponsors, if you can you know, occasionally look at the screens on the side, we'd like to acknowledge the sponsors, Treaty 8, the first one, but um, you know, our, our partners, the Government of Canada, British Columbia, our media partners, CFNR Radio, also our, our partner, um, Spectra Energy. 
So there's also many others on the back of your brochure and on the side walls. But uh, if you are looking for something to take home with you that's from the local Treaty 8 area, there's an art and craft sale going on in the lobby area. Be sure to take part. Uh, there's some really awesome art, the excellent artists here. And um, to also let you know that uh, there's going to be a sign, a large uh, white sign in the foyer. And uh, if you could take the time to put your signature on that, as uh, you know, as your stamp of being here, that will be um, will be uh, appreciated. And if you could as well, in your in your pamphlet that you've been given, this pamphlet has in it a feedback form, and uh, uh, another um, uh, a form in there, a feedback form to uh, give us your impression of how the conference went. It's important you do that. We will stop at some point. I'd appreciate you filling it out, but we'll stop at some point in the future to. Um, to actually have that uh, happen for about five minutes. We have this afternoon um, a full session that uh, will be starting in the breakout rooms again. So again, look in your agenda.